Hey guys, it's Andy. Hope you're kicking ass out there. Hope you're just fucking shit up. Hell yeah. We're going to start the show. No voicemails um, tonight or today or whatever time it is. I'm in Switzerland at a gas station uh, finishing up this podcast. But we're doing a world premiere. I did a single with our boys, Little Stranger. Yes, to start this, we're about to go on tour with them. Uh, we wrote a song called What a Life. And uh, it's about the ups and downs of being a musician and how we wouldn't want it any other way. And for special guests, we're going to do this introduction with Niels. He is actually going to speak in f- Dutch to you. Are you going to do Dutch or are you going to do German? Dutch as fuck. Dutch as fuck today. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, Chris, play the flutes and Niels, take it away. Uh, geniet en luister naar de wereldpremiere van Andy Fresco en the UN. Een nieuwe single samen met Little Stranger called What a Life. Enjoy. You can't be perfect. You've got to learn to get more pleasure out of this game. A long story. Come on now, tell me. Just a neon circus clown. Ring of fire coming to your town. What does happen? Don't know who I am when the lights go down. Remember? I remember. Good time, Charlie, Uncle Sam. Jester John. Health and wealth and good posture. We are back. Andy Frasco's World Saving Podcast. I'm Andy Frasco, and this is my co-host and sax player this week. Yeah. 
And this is We're back the together. Berlin. We're in Berlin. We are in Berlin. Hello, it's oh. the Jewish New Year. <laughs> yeah, I was entertaining Germans on my uh, on the Jewish holiday. That was funny when you told them all Happy New Year during the gig last <laughs> night. And then what'd you call them the night before during the I'm freeze like, part? He does this part where he makes everybody freeze, <laughs> like a wedding or something. And uh, <laughs> last night you said in Stuttgart, which is a very German place down and, there in the south. There, yeah, it's pretty it's German. Not, here it's a little more international, you know. You call them all obedient. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are very obedient. And he looks back at me and I was going, eh, 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 no, 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 no. That's how things do you think, start. Do you think they like understand what I'm trying to say? Mm, I hope not. I hope not. No, either. I don't know. I didn't mean it like you're obedient. Like, I know you didn't you mean got, it that way. You had a, a dictator. To be fair, they were being very obedient. Like, <laughs> I they was froze, like, hey, you're listening to me. They froze way better than any American crowd would have froze. There would have been like some drunk guy yelling, fuck you yeah, in the back. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. Don't take my rights. These colors don't run. These colors don't run, brother. <laughs> These colors don't freeze. <laughs> Uh, this room looks like a church, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of stuff here looks like a church because all the buildings are old because they preserve things in Europe. Yeah, what what's wrong with us? I think it's a uh, well, I don't want to use the word capitalism. It's so passe to blame everything, but like you know, in America, we don't have um, health care or free college or any sort of we don't get anything back for our taxes. Yeah, so everybody's constantly trying to make money. So it's much better to just build something new and sell it for more than replace the windows. This is bull. This is why our. This is why our um, there's the biggest hurricane ever right now. Really? Did you hear about that? I, I'm like so out of touch on this right now. Uh, like Hurricane Ida or oh. Hurricane Fiona or coming up the coast of Florida, right? How do they make up hurricane names? Um, it's alphabetical. I know that. I know it's like if so. Ida means it's like the I. That's so it's like there's men however oh, many letters that is. And you know I know a little bit of everything, don't you, bud? Trivia, baby. No. Uh, but climate change, because we're just building new shit when... Look at this. This building's still dope. It's probably from like the 1700s. I th Yeah, I don't I don't know, but it seems like it. But I don't know. Just all over Europe, buildings are older. If you go to England, I mean, there's like... There's literally churches from the 600s still standing there out in the country and stuff. Are you having fun in Europe? I'm having a great time. Even more than Me I thought too. I was going to. Yeah. I noticed... One thing I noticed about you compared to last fall tour, you're much... You're way less anxious and mad and you're... Like, yeah. Maybe you're just doing better here. Yeah. There, there was like the van was all fucked up last year and stuff. Yeah. And it's like... Uh you know, like I don't put, I'm, I don't, I'm trying not to put as much pressure on myself. You learned that from me, I think. Yeah, because it's pointless. What's the point? Because it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything, and it's just your, your. It's the same thing every day. It's mm -hmm. like you're just the only thing that's changing is your mind state. Yep. And if you change your mind state, you actually become happier. Yeah. Or even if you don't change it, you can be happier. Just don't make it worse. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just like you just are starting to realize like you can't control everything. You know? Yeah, I can't. A lot of stuff's out of your control. That's why I liked about coming here. It's really good for you to come here and work and have, you know, smaller shows, people you've never seen in your life having a good time. But yeah. then you realize, wow, I am really just not very important in the world. Like there are, <laughs> there's millions of people uh, almost halfway around, you know, not all Jesus the way around. Jesus Christ, Nick. No, but I mean this in a good way. Like there's other people living their own sentient lives that yeah. I would have never right. seen if I didn't I come you. over here. They have no effect on them. I they have you. really no effect on me. So maybe just relax a little bit because there's 7 billion people on the earth. And that's what I love about the Europeans. Everyone is kind of very chill. We are loud motherfuckers, by the way. Oh, Americans. yeah. We were out at the bar till about 5 a.m. Everywhere night. we go, I'm like, God damn it. We're so much we were louder. We screaming than last. We're I was so loud. I didn't realize how loud we are until you, you go into these old echoey rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my god, man. Maybe that's Americans why they're loud as fuck. Beats is like, ah! Yeah. And Sean's like, ah! Yeah, and they're not even, like, fucked up yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, even at, like, the gas station during the day, we're louder than everybody else. Yeah. We're just like, Americans are loud and proud, baby. Yeah. Tour's been fun. Bomberg was fun. I love that Switzerland, city. Switzerland, a little weird. Those people are different. What is it about them? They're, they're just neutral. neutral. I think their whole thing is their personalities are neutral. Their government's neutral. <laughs> they're very secretive. They're very, they don't. Yeah. They're not very forward, just like their banks. Their banks are very secretive. Yeah, I, th I think it's weird how the personality kind of kind of represents the culture and the government even. Do you think places. they beat off to like neutral porn? I don't, dude, that was the thing in Switzerland. I flipped on the hotel and at like every other channel was porn. There. Yeah, they have a lot of porn out. Like you could have like toll free, not toll free, but they'll charge the shit out of you. But yeah, I got drunk one time and called one of those hotlines. Oh, hello. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> 
no, 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 no. Chill, 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 chill. No, but we're yeah, still in Germany. They're very neutral there, I, but they were cool. Yeah, they fun. like took them about half an hour to get into the set. Every, you know, that's the thing. Americans are ready to go downbeat. Mm-hmm. Well, you have to like really earn. You got to really earn it out here. But they're moshing by the end of the night. Like, yeah. Do you think maybe it's because like they don't have openers here? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. There's no warm up. There's so no like, warm up, and you start at like uh, like some shows we started at seven thirty or I eight p.m. and crazy. we're done by ten. I really like. I think Bamberg's my favorite city so far. Isn't it though. A beautiful city. I well, you were, we're about to explore Berlin. You're gonna love this. Yeah. No, I'm city. not like saying it's bad here or anything. I'm just saying that was. I just like the quaint sort of old vibe of Bamberg. It didn't get bombed. It didn't get bombberged. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Christ. Well, who's there, baby? Um, Berlin definitely did, and Stuttgart very industrial because they got bombed really hard during World War II. Who baby. got bombed harder, Berlin or Stuttgart? Probably. I don't. I don't actually know, but I know Stuttgart got lit up pretty hard because you know how they have all the car factories there now, but back then it was like military factories. Right. So them B seventeens were coming in from London, just dropping bombs on them. That's why they have all like the very sterile buildings. Speaking about getting lit up, Dialed in Gummies. Hell yeah. Dialed in Gummies, one of our sponsors. I actually miss them. I haven't had a Dialed in Gummy in fucking Bro, four I'm, weeks. I'm getting the shakes. I'm getting the shakes, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Maybe getting you're them. addicted to Dialed in Gummies. <laughs> I'm getting them from gummies, though. <laughs> we, you, we got that little weed tincture out here. Yeah, I finally got to taste that last night, and that yeah. knocked me out. I found some weed. You took me to, da- it took me to I, sleepy oh, town. Oh, did I tell you I got some weed? Oh, sick. I found some weed last night. Some uh, German game. Oh, that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have weed now. We don't like traveling with any drugs on us. We shouldn't anyway. But, yeah. Um, it is legal to have it on you, I think. Like, I don't think that's... Yeah, but not yeah. in Bavaria. When we were in uh, Germany, Stuttgart. like, yeah, Southern, if yeah, we go yeah. to Bavaria, like Southern, our old tour manager, Rolf, um, God bless his heart. We miss you, buddy. I met uh, him, right? Our Dutch. And Neil's great. Neil's rules. Dutch people are cool. Dutch people might be the most like pleasant people on earth, I think. Yeah. I was listening to Neil's talk to his girlfriend on the phone the other day in the yeah. uh, like in the green room. It sounds like the most pleasant, like singy, songy little it sounds like they're doing yeah, they're a like, Disney musical or something. Yeah, it, it's like little oh, elves. Oh, yes. And then I went over here and I'm so happy because I go to the doctor for free. <laughs> free healthcare makes me smile. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um but yeah, Rolf, our old tour manager from the Netherlands, we got pulled over in Bavaria. And just because he was Dutch, the German uh, police officers made him take a blood test to see a how blood much test? a blood test on the side of the road. They like injected him. Like yeah, well they take him to like a a, a spot, maybe the police office, right? And they still. blood test, but like weed stays in your system for thirty days, see, so it's basically are, a fucking trap. And that's like some things you know, like everything isn't better here. Like you can't do that in America. You can't just pull someone yeah. to us somewhere and stick a needle in them. This is why we get our. This is why we rent vans in Germany because if we had. Dutch license plates. Oh, I was wondering. And we're about going that. through the border. Like last time we were in Switzerland, we had to take off all our clothes and to check our assholes to see if we had drugs in them. Bro, these colors would have not run if they would have <laughs> maybe do that. <laughs> anyway, dialed in gummies. <laughs> dialed in gummies. Um, they're the best. Solventless. Solventless. Tastes great. Yep. And uh, clean, homogenous. Yeah, you I can't wait homogenous? to have them. And when I get back to America, you remember what homogeneity is? Homogeny is like the unit. Oh, yeah, I do. You told me this. Um, it's like every piece of it has a perfect dosage. Equal spread. Equal spread. There you go. Yes. See, I'm learning. And Let's they're like the best go. at that. They are. Mm, you're a smart guy. I'm lear- I mean, I'm just listening now. <laughs> are, yeah, you are, actually. I am. Last I'm really night, trying to take it all in. Last night, you asked me about my parents and my family. I didn't know you had a dad. You didn't know I had a dad. Where do you think I came from? I, <laughs> I could actually, I could see someone thinking that I just sort of appeared one day. <laughs> You know I didn't I mean? know you had parents. Shh, 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 when am I going to meet them? I don't know. Hmm. Maybe if, we, if you go to Albuquerque, I'll, I'll bring my mom out. Do you think they're booking agents at um, Repsy.com? My mom is doesn't have representation right now, actually. So maybe she should. Maybe your mom should get hired by Repsy.com. One more sponsor, Repsy.com. Guys, are you in a band? Are you um, an independent promoter? Are you, uh, what else? Juggler. Or what do they do out here in Germany that's entertaining? Probably I saw a bunch of people in Leiden Lizens. Some where they like, Kick their legs and stuff. If you want to make schnitzel live on stage, <laughs> <laughs> sign up for Repsy.com. They'll help you out. Um, they're the best. Um, at a, I think they're... Oh, fuck. It's been a minute since I've seen those boys, and I wish... Because I've been looking at their Instagram, and they're They're popping. blowing up. They're blowing up. Are All you going to Birmingham on this next... Um, I don't think you I'm are. Not, no, we said we declined the Birmingham. Why? Offer. Because, like... 
Didn't Birmingham is a great miss? city when it, you play on the weekend. Oh. If you play, there's a lot of cities in America yeah. that like you have to say no to if it's a, if you get an offer during the week because mm -hmm. it's just not going to be tight. You can't do Beham on a Wednesday. Yeah, it's just blue collar people. Like I got to work, bro. I'm not going to get wasted. Dude, at I Frasco respect that show. about them. Yeah, it's some, some. I like that club that we played in Birmingham. Not like so. us degenerates who just drink every fucking day, yeah. but hey. Well. Yeah. Anyway, sign in for Repsy.com. Um, what do you want to do today in Berlin? I, I want to eat donor. That's all I want. But like, but you can get that everywhere though. I, feel I know like over here. That's true. And I love. I just love kebab. But it's been making my stomach just. I have to knots. see the Berlin Wall. I feel like you can't not see that. It's such an important cultural. You want to hold hands? Go to the Holocaust Museum. Oh my God! Sure, why not? <laughs> I'm going to hold hands anywhere. It's going to it be It is a really great museum, and I learned a lot. Yeah. Because the Holocaust was fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's pretty fucked up, the Holocaust. Well, yeah. I, you know, it's like we are so isolated from the Holocaust. That right, like, right, right. When you're actually here, like last year we went to the concentration camps, and that shit was fucking weird. heavy. Heavy, dude. This is the energy of that probably never leaves the place. Sound huh? like it's haunted. Almost. Oh, yeah. If I really, when we were walking through Dhaka, I was like, oh, wow. I don't. I'm just walking. I mean, and you're Jewish. World. Yeah. You had to have relatives that were. Yeah, killed. Yeah, for sure. No way you don't. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. In Dhaka, probably. Yeah, I don't know. Because my, yeah. my mom is. Uh, but your mom's side is Jewish, right? Russian Jew. Which or makes kind of like Russian. Poly, Ashkenazi, they Ashkenazi. Call it. Ashkenazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my dad's Italian. So he was a bad guy. <laughs> he was a bad guy. <laughs> True love. That's where. Yeah, that's how well, it. Well, he wasn't. He was an American, Italian American. There's a yeah, difference. Italian Angelina. Americans storm that beach too. You know what I mean? <laughs> Italian Americans storm that beach too. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, I want to go. Um, we might get tattoos. What are you going to get a tattoo of? Um, I've been really obsessed with prosciutto. Floyd, Floyd forever. Get, oh my god, it's getting it's getting gay. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second. Talk about the tattoo first. I want to get prosciutto. You know the the ham leg, yeah, the yeah, prosciutto, prosciutto leg, really thin. Yeah, the real, but I want to get the whole shank. Is that a reference to something? Yeah, it's Italian. Oh. And I wanted to get it in Spain because we were in Italy and they just have these big old ham legs on just yeah. on the walls. They cut it real thin, right? Yeah, it's so tight. Italians do everything very nice. Man, I, man, stylish. I, want, I want to move to Europe. You do, but it'd be very hard to tour in America. Actually, it really no, wouldn't. No, would it? It really would It's literally a six-hour flight. You could keep your house in Denver and just Airbnb it. And just, should I just buy a house in Berlin? I'm not going to tell you not to. I mean, it'd be so much easier. It would be fun, too. And people just, like, are so much... I mean, I'm not dogging on Americans. I no, love no. Americans. We're, but we're only, like, saying good things about Europe. It's not like this is... Like, two things can be good. Yeah. It's just Maybe different. that's what I need. I was thinking of getting a house in Brooklyn or, like, Buffalo. Brooklyn is sort of, like, played out now, I feel yeah. like. It's just, like... But you could get, like, a high-ceiling place here for, like, $300,000. Well, I, you know, to me, it's so weird to me that it's cheaper. I would have thought it would have been, like, way more expensive here for some reason. Yeah, it's Just not. in my mind, it seems like it's a world, you know? I bought, I bought the whole round. We were drinking until, like, 5 a.m. last night. <laughs> that's one thing that's great. All the bars are open until 5 a.m., even on a Sunday. Yeah. It's so pretty it's awesome. cheap here, too. I bought maybe three hours of drinks for everybody. I only spent 140 euros. I thought it was going to be really expensive because I had like Iceland in my mind for yeah. when I just traveled there. That shit is expensive. That was like... Yeah, They're that's... like forcing you not to drink how expensive yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. But so I was like, oh, it must be just... That's how Europe is. But really, it's just Iceland. What were you saying about the Floyd thing? It's getting... It's going pretty far, huh, it's guys? pretty good. Last night... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to break this down for you. Last night, the whole Floyd, Andy being in love thing, it went up another at least one notch. <laughs> At one point, first of all, I, first of all, other nights it's been like 10 minutes in the set, you know, a little bit here and there. Last night, I think the first half of the set, you were sexually assaulting him. <laughs> At one point, you guys ended up, the picture's online, right? You guys were shirtless facing each other in like the Happy Gilmore Endless Love situation. <laughs> what? Friends listen to Endless Love in the Dark, just singing to each other. What song was that? Main Squeeze? Flo yeah, we were singing Main Squeeze as a duet. Oh and we both took off God. our shirts. We're going to do that Dolly Parton thing. Oh, no, 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 no. Islands in the stream. That is what you are. I'm just know. going to stare into his eyes, and we're just going to have one mic. Give in love with <laughs> each other. Uh oh. We're just going to oh, freak no, Americans no, no. out. The people who really just like don't like this band, we're just going to dig real deep into that's what, their that's, I like that because homophobic world. Because it's not homophobic, it's the opposite. What? No, no, no being. 
No, the people who don't like all the stuff we do with oh, me and I was gonna say, me and Floyd. Floyd. No, I fuck. I don't you guys are fuck. in love. I'm you're in two love men in love. Yeah. If he, yeah, <laughs> you would lay with that man biblically. I would, but he smells. He smells terrible. Uh, in suit guard, I was like, did I not put deodorant on? Like during the set, I was like, yeah. I was like God. and then it was Floyd, like three yeah. feet away. We were like, <laughs> we're, what was it in Switzerland or maybe the first night? We're like, let's switch shirts. Oh, Bomberg. Well, let's switch shirts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and were like, I, oh, God. I put that on, and it just like. It's like I felt. It's like DACA. <laughs> that, that that sense of oh my God. The heaviness. Yeah. <laughs> what has gone on in this shirt? <laughs> yeah. What has gone on over the decades uh, in this shirt? What? Why does he sweat so much? He's going uh, pretty he hard. Wears the, he wears the same pants, and Floyd I guarantee not you, he probably changed. doesn't wear the same. He probably wears the same underwear. I don't think Floyd has changed clothes in. But six why months. am I so attracted to him? He is a very masculine, masculine. I know man. he's got a that, really great. He's jaw. got that pilot jawline. Yeah, you know got what I'm talking about? Danny DeVito. He's also jaw. kind of a jack dude. Yeah, he is. He's built to last. He's a man. He's like a blue collar man. He's yeah. He's also five. married to a woman. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a that's a debacle. Yeah, but he's a good looking dude. He's God, got you he's know hot. what else is attractive about him? He's got that hey, I'm Floyd voice. Yeah, you know like, what I mean? Hey. Or when he laughs, like ha, ha, I'm filled ha, with ha. testosterone. Hey. Look at me. I am only testosterone. I'm Floyd Nantucket. <laughs> All right. Let's get out of here. Yeah, that's not enough, right? But let's get out. We have uh, Kevin Morby on the show. He's awesome. He, we actually, it's so weird. I, I um, recorded this interview with Kevin Morby like a couple months ago. Yeah, I remember that. And he was talking. We were talking all about Europe. Oh, I'm weird. Like, oh, perfect. And I re-listened to the interview to you know, get some. I'm like, fuck, we're in Europe. No, he's just. Ben he got big in Europe before he got. He's from Kansas City. Oh, that happens though. Yeah, we had we. You that know, happened to you a little bit, low key, yeah. a little bit, right? He had great analogies about, um, you know, like I love comparing athletes to musicians, and he's yeah, yeah, a yeah. diehard baseball fan, like World Royals fan. Royals? And he he gave us a good point about farm league and how it's the same as being an indie rock band. Yeah, I remember I was telling you about how you're a triple A band. Yeah, yeah, or double A. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think. No, you're double A. It's better than triple A, actually. Double A. Because you have a better chance to make it to the majors. Yeah, if you're in triple A like and you stay a, in triple A, you, might not, you might not make the majors. But you might make 100K a year for 10 years playing baseball. You know what I mean? I want I want more than that. I know. You want to be you want to be Albert Pujols. I want to be I want the set. Congratulations yeah, to Albert Pujols. Yeah, by the way, 700 home runs. That's like 700 more than I ever hit. That is unbelievable. That and is I love crazy. it that they did it. it he, that happened in Dodger Stadium. I also love that he's like a really good dude. Yeah, did you he see is. he gave that jersey from that game to some kid? Yeah, and he's like, he. I, I read an interview where he's like, you know, I don't care about material things. It is a gift. If you want to give it back to me, I would like The it. ball? Yeah. That's awesome. It's so cool. He's like, if you want it and keep it, this is a souvenir sport. Yeah, yeah, habit. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's my and 700 home run. he gave away his jersey to some 10-year-old Fucking boy that was legend. by the dugout. Uh, the, the kindness. You this would do what, that. Yes, I would. I give out all my jerseys, and then I have to go back to fanatics.com and buy the same <laughs> fucking jersey. I give all my fans my jerseys. I'm like, fuck, I really love that Will Chamberlain jersey. So I just bought it again for the third time. <laughs> you gave it away? Yeah. I didn't know you did that, actually. People ask for my jerseys now. <sighs> yeah. You know what was great yesterday? You actually moved around and like are having fun. I'm getting more, because I know the tune's better now. Yeah, and I'm, you're like I'm not dancing. like, what's next? What's next? That was one thing I was worried about. Like, okay, we're going to have to step up the the no, I dance. Dancer. I dance and stuff. Your vibe is good. My vibe is better than people think it's going to be on stage. Yeah, I thought you were going to be boring. No, because you see me a lot of times playing gigs where it's like, I met those guys three hours ago. I just yeah. knew their tunes today. I have to play yeah. this right. But now well, I'm yeah, like, it's a, the you know, the pretentious, you know, like, yeah, the jazzy. pretentious Tuesday night jam or whatever. I don't ever go to that, but yeah. Yeah, but you know, like yeah, you yeah, yeah. put your pocket in your hand, or yeah, your yeah. hand in your pocket, right. and just we'll fucking we'll just. Next. But now I'm like learning the tunes, the so music. I can. And plus, you guys are kind of band where I can do funny shit, and it's yeah. not weird. Yeah, if I did some of that shit playing with like Eddie Roberts, I love that. Moron. Now me and you are fucking getting at Floyd. You just flip Floyd yeah, I'm off. Yeah, your little side side I love piece. It. Yeah, always yeah, yeah. every day. You're my boy. <laughs> I got Andy's back. Let's gotta go. go. <laughs> All right, we gotta go. Hell um, yeah. We're gonna go to Berlin. We're gonna drink some espressos. We're gonna look at the Berlin Wall. We're gonna go to Tip Twenty. Tiptoe Charlie's? What is it called? Oh, Checkpoint, oh, Checkpoint, Checkpoint Charlie. Yeah. Tiptoe Charlie. There's a bar you know right Checkpoint next to it. Checkpoint Charlie is? It's like, yeah, where they open. It's a crossover. It's a crossover, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's a bar right there. Of course there is. We got a, a bar for everything here. I fucking love it here. It's weird because you never see anybody like fucked up though, except for in Stuttgart, but it was Oktoberfest. And you you could, you know, you could test for me. I know Brian doesn't believe me, but you could test for me. I haven't really been going out. No. All week. No. I waited. I don't think I've even seen you like that drunk. No, what I said to you yesterday or two days ago? What in the backstage? Um, I don't remember actually. I was like, God, my life is way more. Oh boring. yeah, 
<laughs> my life is way more boring with you in the band. Yeah, if you ever want, uh, if you guys, if any girls out there, I should start a service where, like, if you want your boyfriend to chill out a little bit on partying, you just, like, <laughs> give me, like, 200 bucks a night, and I'll, I'll go out with him. The guy will be home by 2 in the morning. <laughs> He'll still have fun, though. You know what I mean? But you know what I mean? I'll be like, hey. Yep. Let's wrap it up. All right. We got to go. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Um, enjoy Kevin Morby. Next week is you and me for an hour. Fuck yeah. We're going to cook. I can't wait. We're going to be cooking. <laughs> Everybody, people love it when it's just me and you. Yeah. And then we're going to start this Patreon soon. Yeah, we got to. I have I'm almost up. done with the tour. That's the thing. It's, Once it's, I'm done with this shit. It's set up, guys. We just haven't had time to get the content. Andy's a very important guy. He's the boss man. So Yeah, I got to be a rock star. That's his new nickname, guys. Start calling him boss man. Hashtag... <laughs> Fuck you, Hashtag Nick. boss man. No, I'm a team player. <laughs> I don't want to be the boss. Well, good boss is I'm a team trying, player. Every I'm team needs a good boss. I'm really hard to be a team player. I know, you're right. Phil Jackson is a team player, but he's still the boss man. Oh, Brian makes me feel like shit when I, uh, when I become boss man style. It's not called the UN. Yeah. It's called Andy Frasco. Yeah, the UN. Right, I got to, I got to, yeah, we're, we're, um, we're not going there. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, next up on the interview hour, we have Kevin Morby. Yes, I love this dude. This guy is a great songwriter, hailing out of Kansas City. He's really starting to blow up. He's got that um, amazing song that made that Airbnb commercial called Beautiful Stranger. Hey, Chris, play uh, Beautiful Stranger while I'm pimping out Kevin here. Um, Love his songwriting, amazing lyricist. He's uh, He worked really hard throughout his whole career. He started, he got big and in Europe and now he's popping in America and I'm super pumped up and he's uh dating Katie from Waxahachie a little power folk couple over there like uh like Sonny and Cher up in here so ladies and gentlemen please welcome to the interview hour my guest Kevin Morby Kevin Morby hello it is I how's it going buddy it's going good um yeah it's going good where are are you you? are you in nashville no 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 i'm in kansas city i live in kansas city (laughs) oh fuck i used to i used to live in kansas city i lived um 18th and wyandotte no way amazing yeah man um i forgot you you used to live in kansas city you lived in brooklyn and then you moved back or (laughs) tell me that story I've lived here. I grew up here through like my formative years from like age 10 to 18. And then I moved to New York for seven years. And then I moved to LA for like four or five years. And then I moved here in like 2017. What made you want to come back to Kansas City? Um, is I always say it's like I lived in New York and LA. Like I lived in the two most expensive cities in America while I was broke. Like at my brokest, I lived in the expensive places. And once I started making money, I was like, I gotta, I gotta go somewhere where I can, uh, you know, save this money. So tell me, tell me how long did it take you to start really making dough in this uh, songwriter world? I would say, I mean, if you collect all the years of me joining Woods, uh, the, I used to be in a band called Woods and I joined them when I was like 18, 19, which is a big, big deal. Um, and kind of changed everything for me. Um, and that's the first time I started making money but i mean i like i would make some money on the road i'd only like lose a little bit of money overall yeah. you know I, like in the early days of touring i would work my ass off to then it tour felt like a vacation like i'm gonna work so I, i'm gonna have like 600 dollars to like blow on tour and <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so um like there would be money involved but i was still losing money if that makes sense like i'd get paid uh-huh. to the shows but it wouldn't be enough to like cover the cost um and so then I started releasing records under my own name and like I went solo um, around 2013. And I would say like around 20, like, like 2016, 2017 is when I really started to make some money where I was like, okay, this is, I, I'm making some decent money off of music. I don't want to fuck this up because if this, if this money goes away. Who knows? You know? Yeah, totally. Knows? So yeah. let's go back to uh, your first band. It was called Woods. Well, yeah, I was in a band. It wasn't my band. I, I played bass in a band called Woods. Like I joined them. They already had a couple of records out. And then I started my own band called The Babies right around the same time. So I kind of had the two bands and I would I would just juggle the two of them and I would I would tour like half of the year across both bands. And then when I would be back in New York, I would be working my ass off. You know, I would I would 
the day I would get home, I would go work a double shift or whatever. Yeah, because if you know, if, like living in New York, like even having two bands, it probably felt more like a vacation because like you couldn't make enough money to for those two or three months off <laughs> to like you know save for that. So it's like you're basically working three jobs. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, luckily, I see a lot of people who are like trying to get going in their 30s or like they're a little bit later and they're like, you know, what? I'm going to give music a shot. And I wish them all the luck in the world. But because I, I, I can't imagine getting going at any time other than, you know, when I did, like in my late teens, early 20s, when you have the infrastructure and the energy to like, you know, be broke as, as, yeah. as, as possible, not really care, you know? Yeah. What was the moment? Like, what was your like brokest moment on tour? I mean, I remember the first time Woods did this tour of the West Coast, and I remember it was maybe like second or third tour with them. And Jeremy, who's the singer and songwriter of Woods, he handed me twenty dollars. He was like, "This is for you," and I was like, "What? What's this for? Like, why are you giving this?" To me? And he was like, "He's like, this is the money. Like, we we we're, we we're starting to make some money, and this is split four ways. Here's your twenty bucks." And I was like, "I just made, I just made money off of playing music. This is unbelievable." Yeah. Um, but I broke is, you know, just those early days of like, you just would always you'd meet people at the shows and you'd crash with them, which again, it sounds like a fucking nightmare now if I ever had to redo that. But at the time it was like the, it was super fun. Yeah. Um, and romantic. Just, it's like that artist, that vagabond thing we always wanted to do when we first became musicians. Yeah, exactly. And you're meeting people and it's so fun. And, you know, so I mean, the brokest days were like in a, a lot of ways, like the funnest, most carefree days. And like what I look back on now, like what I remember, like in my like mind of like, what, what, like what would a typical day on tour look like in those days? And you're always like crashing on some floor where people are smoking cigarettes inside. And it's just like, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And you're like, where do I sleep? And people are, it's like a one room apartment and they're like, you know, just crash wherever. And like, like the party's still going on around you and the lights are all on and people are doing drugs and you're like, I guess I'll just close my eyes and like throw my <laughs> coat over me and yeah. just no pillow, best. just get, waiting for pink eye to enter your, into your yeah. immune system. Yeah, man. That, yeah. Uh, Do you ever tour in Europe? Oh, a lot. I've toured in Europe probably more than I have in America. Yeah, me too. What is it about Europe that they're so fascinated with lyrics and songwriting versus America? I mean, you're in a scene where both American scenes are America and European scenes, but I really feel like Europe is all about the folk and all about the lyrics. How important is lyrics to you? Lyrics are everything to me, I think. You know, I don't have like, I'm not like the greatest singer or the greatest guitar player. And I've always been interested in stories, you know, all my favorite songwriters. It's been less about the technicality and more about the story that they're getting across. So mm -hmm. lyrics kind of everything. I've thought about that a lot. It's kind of evened out for me a little bit now where I'm basically like the same size in, you know, Paris as I am in New York or something. But for a long time, it was a significant, it was significantly bigger in Europe. And um, I always felt, you know, I think in America, there's this thing of when you show up at shows or like when I first started to get written about in magazines or on blogs or whatever, people in Europe seem to see that and take it as truth and be like, Oh, this guy must be good. Whereas in America, I feel like people are like, we'll give him a shot. Maybe we'll see if he can prove himself. So <laughs> it's just like a lot more skeptical, you know, I, and maybe it's because Americans reading about an American, they're like, this, this there's no way this is true, but I'm going to go to the show and I'll check it out. But I don't know if I'm going to like it. Yeah. And in Europe, it's like, you know, oh, the, yeah. how are you so, how are you so amazing? You know? And you're like, oh, I, you know, I just, I just, I just wake up this way. I, I can't help it. Do you think the American dream made us more competitive as people? And 100%. Absolutely. Maybe you know, that's I why think, they like, kind of like, don't believe it at first when it's in the magazines. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a, a lot of competition in anything you do in America. And I think there's a lot to be said for, I mean, it's an unhealthy way to live. Um, but I also think it's what produces great art. You know, like I always say, like when you go to Europe and you play these places, these like sort of cultural centers where they have um, everything and it's government funded and there's, there's money going into the arts. Like, man, why can't we have this in America? And I think that it would create a better a healthier, uh, uh, you know, uh, America. But I also, uh, you know, it's not lost on me that great art often comes from struggle, 
And right. so I think being an American musician, having to go against the grain and, and, you know, like these stories I was just talking about, you, you tour in the early days and you're, you're broke as you can possibly be, but it's, it's like it, it weeds people out who don't actually want to do it or something, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I heard you're a big baseball fan. It's kind of like the same thing. The 1%, you know, the people who are yeah. dedicated to it, who are, are going to like work your way up. I really feel like touring is kind of like a making in the music industry is kind of like making it in the majors. Cause you have to like work your way up. You start in fucking farm league towns and you move your way up to like second tier towns. Like what do you see in relation to baseball to like, what's the parallels between being in the music industry and baseball? It's you're like asking the most perfect question for me. It's I, like three nights ago, I was telling a friend all about independent baseball versus like minor league farm team towns. Yeah. And I was I, literally telling him, I was like, it's like indie rock. You know, these things are like indie rock. So <laughs> I think there's a lot of comparison. It's really funny you bring that up. Um, but I think there's a ton of comparisons, you know, so in a farm league, like minor league system where, if, you know, if you get drafted by the Royals, but they're like, we're going to send you to the Omaha storm chasers uh, yeah. <laughs> before you come up here, you're still kind of in the pipeline. You know what I mean? Like you're still like you're a professional athlete and you are in a direct pipeline of you can then maybe make it to the majors. But then there's the independent leagues, which we have an independent team here in Kansas City called the Monarchs, which is uh -huh. a sort of revitalization of the Negro Leagues team of yeah. the Monarchs who Jackie Robinson played for. And um, if you go out to the stadium out in Kansas City, Kansas and watch the Monarchs play, it is like, it's almost like the sad carnival, you know, like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. totally. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, but it's like, you know, $20 <laughs> gets you right behind home plate yeah. and like $5 like out on the lawn. And so I, when I first started going out there, I was like, man, what is like, like up with these players? And a lot of the players, some of them have come from the majors and they're just too old to play in the majors anymore. So, but they, they want to still play. And some of the, um, so, but then it's a lot of kids who didn't get drafted into these farm leagues by these major franchises who want a second chance, you know, so they're probably like the best kid in their high school, but they didn't get drafted. So they ended up in the independent leagues and, you know, the price. So if you're in the independent leagues, the minimum you can get paid a month is $350 a, a month. And Do they the house you too. They don't house you. So a lot of, a lot of these players stay with host families. So Holy it's, fuck. I know in a lot of these players, you know, they're not from America. They're from the DR or, or Puerto Rico or Venezuela. And like, you know, so these people come and they'll come with their families. They'll stay with the host family, like in Kansas City, Kansas with like, you know, some nice old couple who's yeah. like, we love baseball, you know, like stay in our, <laughs> our guest room. And it's and a lot of these players drive for Uber and stuff because the max they can get paid is $1,500 a month. They get paid nothing, but it's that thing. It really reminds me of music because I'm like, a lot of these kids are in their late teens, early 20s. They're doing the thing. They're doing their equivalent of sleeping on the floor, making it work in whatever way they can possible in the hopes that, you know, they can make it. And if they don't, if they don't um, do that, you know, there's 400 people behind them who will gladly do what they're doing. So I actually made friends with the player. He was really cool. And um, I I started talking to him in the crowd one 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 evening at one of these games. And he had just, he's from South Carolina. His name's Cody Mincy. Shout out to Cody Mincy. But Shout he out. had come up from the he had come from the Mexican leagues and I was asking him all about, you know, how the infrastructure of these independent leagues, but then he got drafted. He's so now he's in the farm farm, um, like pipeline. He's like playing for the, uh, for the Rays, uh, like single a team or something like that. But it's a fascinating world. And I think it's very comparable. Like I say, if you're on the Royals, it's based like the Royals are like the Foo Fighters. And then, you know, the Omaha storm chasers are like, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, the war on drugs or something. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Or even you know, like, and then like labels too. Like you say, like the Royals is like Atlantic and then there's all the sub sub labels that you sign on first to yeah. see if you have, uh, see if you could sell this many units and see if you could sell and they'll keep moving you up the fucking ladder. It's like a rat race. Exactly. Exactly. That's a, that's maybe a better analogy for it. And then the independent leagues is like, I'm putting my shit on band camp, really just trying to get myself up. <laughs> so, I mean, technically the farm league to you, let's talk back to your career. The farm league to you was Europe, right? You kind of grew 
You said you were touring Europe just as much as you were touring America in the earlier years, and that was catching on more. Do you feel like you've developed your sound through touring through Europe more than you toured through uh, America? That's a yeah. I, w- I was playing European baseball. That's where I did my time. <laughs> I. Um, that's a great question, and that's that's very insightful because it, it's very true. Um, yes, because I was able to get gigs over there. It'd be in the early days, you know, I could play Los Angeles or New York to like. 50 people yeah. at like a record store and it have to be like a free event. But then I could go play Paris or play Berlin or London and I would sell out like a 200 capacity place. It felt legitimate, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, like, like this guy, um, you know, this, this, this pitcher friend of mine where he, he was telling me, he's like in the Mexican leagues, you know, all these games are always all sold out. He's like, right. then I come up here and you know, this place six seats, 6,000 people. And there's probably never over a thousand, you know, it's a different thing. And it was very, it was exactly like that for me in Europe. Um, yeah, it felt legitimate. And I felt like, um, the beginning iterations of my band really took shape by touring over there. And I was really figuring out how to be sort of a a solo songwriter over there. What'd you learn? What were you learning in your head to make you feel more confident in yourself? I think the biggest thing that happened was actually sort of a financial, um, logistical thing where, I, I did a couple tours in the States, sort of unsuccessful tours in the States where I was taking out like a four piece band. Um, and coming from woods and the babies, I was just kind of doing the same formula as those bands and um, like, okay, well I'm, I'm coming from this infrastructure where there's these, you know, four people on stage playing music. So that's what this should look like. And it just, what I, the bands were fine, but I just wasn't quite getting it quite right. And then I was going over there for my first ever European tour and I could only afford to take one other person. So I took my best friend, Justin, who plays drums. Mm-hmm. And us doing the two-piece forced us to sort of break the songs down to their parts and make it less about like, let's just go out there and rock. And more like, let's go let's go out there and sort of get inside the songs, kind of break them down to like the most basic elements and go from there. And it, it learned, I, it taught me this huge lesson of how to use space in live performance and how to like make at times the quietest song be the loudest song in a way and sort of demanding a crowd's attention probably made me better with things like banter or just dealing with the crowd because I had less to hide behind. And so, you know, despite the fact that I did a couple of these full band tours in America, it really wasn't until I did that two piece in Europe where I was like, okay, this is the basis. I've broken the band down now and I'll build it up from here. And since then it's like, I just keep tacking more people onto the band, but it kind of began with that two piece. Yeah. It's kind of like the saying vulnerability makes you stronger. If you're like naked yeah. on there, like you, you got nowhere to hide, no bass, no fucking second guitar player. It's, it's you and the songs, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it made me a better singer, I think. And it, it just, I think our first inclination of going over there was like, let's just, let's, let's just play loud. You know, it'll right. do this like two piece thing and play loud. But we're like, actually, I think we need to go the other way and be really quiet. Yeah. And yeah. So I don't know. I, I think when you got like so much of doing music and being a musician and the early days is like, you really just have to do it. Like it's a really like, you know, to, to use a base, a famous baseball, uh, um, phrase if you you got to build it you know you, if you build it a, they, they will come sort of thing yeah and sometimes it's not the people who's coming but it's it's the lesson that's going to lead to the next thing that could then perhaps lead to people eventually one day coming to see you play music so the idea of just doing the work is important yeah and at the time especially and you know there was a certain comfort that i got with woods and the babies like those bands got to a certain size where I'd played major festivals and, you know, played to at moments, thousands of people and headlining shows to, you know, a couple hundred people. And, you know, there was moments towards the end of both those bands where I was making somewhat of a living, um, off doing them all the time. And by giving that up, I knew that it was, it was a gamble. You know, I knew like one of the last things that I did with Woods, I remember we played like a big festival in France and the show was really good. And they had like free, free massages backstage. And I was getting like a massage and I was like, I'm going to quit this band. I may never be back in France. Getting <laughs> Get a massage. massage. Just thinking of pondering life, just <laughs> relaxing. I'm going to quit this band actually. <laughs> I got <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and you know, I was like, I may just be forfeiting this kind of like cool, funny thing that like this band has, has led to. 
Um, and I got to just be okay with that. And there's, there's moments on those early tours where I was like, wow, like I'm really, I may never get the French masseuse ever again. Um, but you know, I remember on one of my first American tours, we played at the auto bar in Baltimore. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Which the auto bar is great. And it's one of those weird venues where like, I feel like big bands play there and small bands play there. Yeah. And I got booked there. I was like, Oh, this is cool. Cause like woods played here and we opened up for big bands here and wow, I'm going to play here. And you know, that club, despite the fact that some big bands will play there, it's not that big. It like can probably fit like three or 400 people. And it's a dive bar. Yeah. Um, and I showed up and they're like, Oh, you guys are upstairs. And I remember being like, the auto bar has a upstairs. Like it has a smaller room. And I went into this like upstairs, like this weird part of the auto bar and played to, <laughs> you know, whatever, literally three people. And I knew the people and <laughs> at least you got a, in there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> At least you get in there. Yeah, exactly. You can, you know, on Instagram, you can make it look like, you know, you, you, you sold the place out. Yeah. My, um, my buddy, John, you know, John Craigie at all? Songwriter. I don't know. Um, he has a great thing about, you know, everyone talks about being sold out, but no one asks the capacity. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. You know, I, that's a great point because I always, you know, my booking agent and I, we're really close and we kind of have this, um, and same, same with my European booking agent, we all kind of have this philosophy of like, well, let's just get into the bigger room and like kind of make it so a sellout's going to be impossible. Um, I mean, we don't do this all the time, but we've, we've booked tours this way where it's like, like, let's get into a bigger room where so it's, it's not impossible, but it, it's, we probably aren't going to grow that much, but we get in the room of the place, you know, a great example would be back to Europe, you know, the Paradiso, the, the legendary yeah. Paradiso. You work um, your way up between play, stages, you know, small, middle, big. Exactly. And I remember playing the small stage on that tour I'm talking about, where it's the two piece and Annie DeFranco was uh, playing the big stage that night. And what, she had the like church? A, a big show. At the church? What's that? You guys, you did Del Nord, you did a uh, Paradiso de Nord, and then she was doing the church. She was doing I just the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the big one, the big yeah, yeah. one, the like 1800 capacity one. Yeah. And, and I was doing, it wasn't even Nord. It was the smaller one, like 200 capacity. The oh, upstairs yeah, yeah. One. oh, yeah, 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 okay. And so I was playing that, you know, probably to like 60 people. And then they let me go on the, like the third balcony to watch her show and it was packed. And um, I remember thinking to myself, like, if I could ever play here, you know, if I could ever just make it here once. And, you know, two years later, two years after that, my booking agent was like, you are selling the amount of tickets, like the bare minimum to get into that big room. If you want to do it, it's like 600 capacity, or we could sell out Paradiso Nord at 500 tickets. Yeah. And I was like, get me in the big room. I was like, he's like, they'll close off both balconies, but you'll get in the big room. And I remember it was so huge for me and it was so good. And so I kind of like that philosophy of like, just get in the room and you know, you can, it's not, you don't have to sell out every gig. If you want to sell out every gig, you could literally just book it to the, to like I could tell you exactly what venues I'd have to play to just guarantee a sold out tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I rather I rather play these venues that I want to play. Yeah, and it's also, you know, it it, it keep it tricks your brain to keep working harder to fill that room. You know, we could get we get comfortable in life. You know, it's like, oh, I could just do these. I think I love comedy, and I think of like the people who just stay in the comedy rooms instead of like trying to move up to the theaters because it's comfortable. I feel like right. it pushes us a little bit. You know. Definitely. You know, and so like Paradiso just his best example. So I did that time and it was like 600 tickets and that was able enough to fill the, fill the bottom floor. And then the second time I went back, they were like, you've sold 850 tickets so we can open up the second balcony, the first balcony. And that felt huge. You know, I was like, oh my God, last time I was here, there wasn't, a, the, no one's on the balcony and those people on the first balcony. <laughs> and then the last time I played was with, in 2019 with the Oh My God band. And it was like, 1100 tickets or something like that. So they opened up the second balcony and it just feels, yeah, it just feels great. And I still haven't sold it out. And I'm like, someday I'll sell that fucker out and that'll feel like a celebration. And then, you know, maybe I'll go back after that and I'm like, you didn't quite sell it out this time, but it's still good. I think in music, people get so caught up in, especially in this age of Instagram and numbers, like these, right. these numbers that mean nothing, but we, it makes us also competitive with ourselves and with others. I think, like the real test is not like if you can sell out a show or whatever. It's just if you can keep going. Like if you want to, if you want to prove yourself as a lifer, it's just being able to take the heat, take it, take the hits, and then like also take the wins and not let those wins get to your head. And like I think as an artist, you know, there's always moments where you you have the big sold out show super quickly, and 
you'll have that. And then that's putting you on a peak. That's putting you on a mountaintop. And then if you fall from that a little bit, you got to be able to take that heat, you know? Right. And that's to really prove yourself as someone who's, who should be doing this. Let's fucking go. Kevin Morby with the fucking advice, baby. Let's go, dude. <laughs> I'm like that too. You know, it's like, it's step by step, you know? We can't just think of the big picture and get overwhelmed. We need to take, you know, we need to keep moving forward. This isn't, you know, we, we keep forgetting that life isn't a finish line, you know? Right. We need right. to... It's really not... Really. Do you ever... Are you competitive? I think I'm... You know, I think that I'm competitive in a very healthy way. I think I did play sports as a kid, and I, I think that sort of trained me to sort of... I, I consider myself a good sport. I consider myself, you know, when the Royals were playing the San Francisco Giants in 2014, mm -hmm. and it was you know, bottom of the ninth runner on third, Alex Gordon on third, Salvi Perez at bat, you know, yeah. full count. Oh, and he could have hit a walk off or he could have, you know, he could have ran Gordon in and they would have tied the game, but he ended in a pop fly and San Francisco won. And I was, I was at a bar in LA and it was all giants fans around me. Um, and I'm the type of guy when that ended and my like soul was crushed in that moment. And right. I was so upset that my team lost, like I forced myself, like I take a breath and I'm like, congratulations, San Francisco Giants. You know, <laughs> like I, <laughs> just I'm like, like biting your they lip. They earned it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they earned it. They played the game and you got to shake the other team's hand. So I do consider myself, I think honestly, like sports trained me in this way to be healthy, have healthy competition and, and, and make it more about like, well, was it a good game? Like, was the series great? Then that's all you care. Like that's, that's what's great about it. You know, totally. Um, so I think health, healthy competition is good, but I think when competition gets in the way of what you're making in a negative way, then it's then it's bad. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm a I'm a diehard uh, basketball fan. I love the Lakers, and I uh, I know I'm in a band as well. So like I my mind state's always like an athlete, just to just to give everything I can on, when I'm out there, or if I'm working, or if I'm doing my my career. I mean. I was thinking about this when you were talking about like you're having a massage and uh, you're about to break up with your band, which is fucking hilarious to me. I don't know. I'm like, hmm, maybe I should be <laughs> contemplating breaking up with my band while she uh, gets that lower nod in my underback. But um, when you're thinking about decisions like that, you know, how hard is it not to think about the other people in the situation that you're about to leave versus? doing something that's good for yourself. Were you, were you guys fighting? Was like, a, was it just felt like your the, the band was plateauing and you needed to get out? Like, how did you make the decision from saying, I don't want to be in a band anymore. I want to do this solo. Well, in the case of Woods, I, I just played bass. So, you know, it wasn't really my band. Oh. I didn't see any room for growth. There was no real room for growth for myself. Like there's growth for the band, but I just felt that my it's not like I was going to be able to make a good living off of just playing bass in a band or, yeah. you know, it, it felt like I'd always have to have a second job doing that. And like, you're at the whim of someone else's decisions and, um, which is, you know, what being in a band, like I was more of a hired gun in that band. It wasn't okay. like, like, like an equal parts band or anything. Um, and those guys are like my brothers, like my best friend still. And then in the, the babies were, it was more collaborative and was more of an equal effort. It was just kind of falling apart. There was a couple in the band who are two very good friends of mine and oh, fuck. they were breaking. Up. We were like, let's try and do the band with you guys broken up. And we all quickly were like, maybe that's not a great idea. And <laughs> so, Drama. And so you know, sorry. Well, it was, it was more like we were like getting, we were making sure there was no drama with yeah. it. And, but even in that, you know, as much as I, enjoyed my days in that band and learned so much in that band like cassie ramon who was the the other um singer and songwriter in that band and co-fronted it with me she had a band called vivian girls and she's such like a natural star and great yeah. songwriter and i really learned a lot being next to her and justin who i was mentioning who was drumming with me when i began my solo career he he drummed in the baby so we learned a lot together in that band um but still being in like an equal parts democratic band just didn't didn't fit for me. You know, I right. wanted to be able to like call in different, different players and call the shots. So, um, yeah, I, it was kind of plateauing and, and just it felt like there's no real room for growth in either band. And it was, but I felt people responding to me in both of the bands, if that makes sense. So I was like, I think maybe I could take 
my efforts and put them into my solo thing and maybe that could that could grow right. um again yeah. it's a big gamble yeah and it's also you know it's a, it's 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 also like you instead of like taking only 25% of the blame if things fuck up. Now, as a solo artist, if things fuck up, it's all on you. <laughs> Which is kind That's of... the thing that you really... It, it's wild. It's a, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. And I think when you get into it, you, you yeah, you just look at the, like, uh, you know, the sunny side of the street where you're like, I'm going to be able to make it sound like whatever I want it to sound like. And I can always take different people on tour. But then... On the other hand, you're like, oh, wait, but like if the tour loses money, only I lose money and I have to pay people. And yeah. All this responsibility comes on you and you're like, and I have to find a band and who's going to want to play with me. And so it is a lot. It's definitely a lot. And I mean, it's even, it all falls under your name. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And now at this point, it's like, I have such a big team and, and so many bandmates. And sometimes I'm like, man, all these people are out here doing this thing in, in, in my effort, you know, to, to help me with my thing. And sometimes it makes me feel kind of crazy, that sense of responsibility, but, um, yeah, it's a lot to take on that you kind of don't think about in the beginning until it starts growing. Um, do you ever so get, it's definitely a big responsibility. do you ever get overwhelmed from all the, all the micro delegation? 100%. I have an amazing team. My manager, Asia, shout out Asia. She's the best. And, shout uh, out to Asia. Let's go Asia. Hell yeah. Asia. Caroline, uh, who works with Asia, she's my day-to-day -day manager, and my label's great, and you know my my publicist's great. Everyone's great, and so I think for me, because I came from like DIY and I came from these smaller scenes, I have a hard time not trying to touch everything and do everything and and make sure everyone's happy. And what I've had to kind of learn in the past couple of years is the, is like I have a manager, like I I I have people to do these jobs. Let them do their job, and like I. I should sort of just maybe take the role more as the artist and the performer mm -hmm. and not be trying to take on everything. Um, and that was a big lesson for me to learn because I think as things were starting to grow in the, but it was still sort of early days, I was still trying to do 100% of the work and I've really had to learn how to step back and sort of just, just do my role the best I can. Yeah. How important is it? How, how important is it to get out of your own way? <laughs> you know? It's so important, you know, it's, it's, and it's something you learn trial by fire because uh, yeah, it's, you gotta, you gotta make the mistakes to, to, to understand, okay, I won't do that again. And again, this all goes back to, I'm so glad that I started doing this when I was young, you know, right. because exactly I was learning lessons when I was like 27 or so, you know, um, what was the biggest lesson of, you learned at 27? Like what was the biggest hardship from the band or from your career? Well, I don't know. I don't know if there's any one like def like career defining thing. I think what I was just touching on has been like the biggest lesson. I've sort of slowly learned it of of you've created this thing and it's it's showing growth and it's it's um and because of that growth, you're able to to bring people on board to fill specific roles. So just let let yourself be the artist and and trust the people that you've sort of surrounded yourself with to to do what they're going to do as well. Does that make sense? Totally. I'm in, I'm in that same way because I used to manage bands before I used to play in music. So now that I have a manager, I'm always button heads with him because I think I can manage when really I'm having, I've been playing music for years. So it's like kind of like, it's like, it's an, it's an ego thing, right? Letting someone control yeah. your life and being okay with it. For sure. It is an ego thing. So it, it's a little bit of like a, a slow ego death and like letting some of that stuff go. And I apply that to a lot of different, uh, you know, facets of life. But um, yeah, I think it, it's, it's all a learning process and it's, it's a, there's, there's so much that I've learned, uh, you know, helping steer the ship of this thing and, and, and being a songwriter. And um, that's one of the major lessons I think is, is, is letting some stuff go and, and trusting in other people. Yeah. You know, it's so true. I'm going to clap to that too, Kevin, because <laughs> fuck yeah. People are afraid. People are afraid to get out of their own way. I don't know why. Is it? Yeah. Is it? Are they scared of trusting people? Is it a trust thing, or why do you think people are scared to get out of their own way? I don't know. And you do see it a lot. You see it in 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 everything. And I certainly see it in music. And I've seen bands sort of self destruct because, um, I, again, I yeah, I think it comes down to ego and trust. It's 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 those issues that, um. Yeah, people get in their own way. I think it's insecurity. I think it, it 
it comes from a sort of deep rooted insecurity. Maybe a lot of times when I see people get in their own way, maybe it's a little bit by design because they're afraid of failure. So they think if someone's going to fuck this up, let it be me. And I have control of that. You know, I'm controlling the fuck up. And um, I I feel like I I see that probably more often or as one of, you know, um, that's that form of self sabotage, I think is pretty, um, you know, it, it, it happens a lot. Please. Well, it's kind of the same thing of like letting go of delegating your life as well. You know, it's like you want to be in control, it seems like, in every asset of your life. So assuming, you know, you're trying to control your fear, what other fears do you have? Um, You know, I think the main fear that every artist has is that it's going to go away at any moment, you know, that people just stop caring. And it's funny, you know, I, I'm doing this rollout. I'm really happy with how the press is going and I'm getting stuff that I'm, I'm, you know, stuff that I'm interested in and I'm glad that people want to talk to me um, from certain outlets. And I, But, you know, there's my seventh record and, you know, if you count the baby's records, it's like my ninth record and the Woods records, it's like my 14th record. Like, yeah. I've seen so many press cycles and each one you're terrified no one's going to care. And I'm the same fucking way, dude. Same way. I don't, Everyone's the same, you know what I mean? Unless you're unless you're bigger than God, you know. There's yeah. obviously there's a line where you know if you're a you know a fucking huge band, you're you're you know some bands get so big that they they don't do any press or whatever because they don't need it. You know their fan base is just so big that no right. matter what they put out, it's gonna be met by tens of thousands of people. But I think until you're to that point, there's still this element of is anyone gonna care? And so when someone does care. I'm not the type of person. I'm never like people need to care about this. And if they don't, what's wrong with them? It's I'm more, I'm very Midwestern in my ways of like, Oh my God, you want to ask me about my album? Like, (laughs) I can't believe people still want to ask me. So I'm very grateful for all of it. Um, But I think that's the, like the common fear of every artist, you know, is, Mm -hmm. is that, or I'm never going to write a good song again. I don't really worry about that. Honestly, like I'm, I, I, I write a lot and I write all the time. And I just, I, you know, knock on wood, I, I, I never have that, that fear, but I know that's a common fear with people. And so, you know, I, I don't know. I think my fears in the past couple of years have been more rooted in war and climate yeah. change and oh, yeah. uh, virus. Well, you know? hell yeah. Um, what about, so <laughs> you, t- <laughs> that's fine. That's, I've, I've, I was, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pussy too about that kind of stuff as well. Um, you talk about, you know, this competitive nature and then you also talk about, this grateful nature in your brain. Do you guys, do those two um, ever fight with each other when you're thinking about things? I think they sort of work together, to be honest with you. I think it's, um, I think it's once you're in the arena, it's, it's okay to be healthily competitive, but I'm also have such gratitude that I've made it into the arena. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, like, I think any competition I would have with any peer of mine or any friend or maybe even someone I don't know would be just because we're both sort of doing the same thing. Like what I would be complaining about. It's funny even thinking of a press rollout. Like I've been, I've been doing great press, you know, but still I'll see someone do like something. It can be some weird corner of the internet. No one even knows about. And I'll be like, why'd that person get that? And I didn't. Yeah. This motherfucker, I swear. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's how the brain, you know, they're doing like, you know, some fucking obscure blog dot geocities dot net. And I <laughs> like your, your, your publicist would have said no to that, but you're just like, I still want yeah. it. I still want it to be sent to me. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you get like a big look and you're like, well, you know, but why isn't this? I don't know. It, it's just the human brain and, and people, especially in these sorts of things, it's like high school, you know, it's, yeah. it's like people are so vulnerable and everyone wants to, Everyone, uh, you know, everyone wants to be be seen and, and and heard in these certain ways, and it's like you got to not let yourself latch onto these things because it's bottomless, you know. Totally. And it's like you you can get the biggest thing, but then the person next to you is going to get the other biggest thing, and you're like, well, why didn't I get both big things? And then there's then kind it's of greed. Yeah, it, it's a funny thing. I've been around long enough and do enough bands and. Um, I've seen so many hype bands come and go and I've been through my own sorts of press cycles where I'm like in the hyped thing. You know, I felt that in woods. I felt that in my own career. And again, it just comes down and it comes back to just continuing, you know, like you just keep going. You look at anyone with a respectable career, 
and you realize you, you see the dips and you see the waves and you see the rises and you see the falls and it's all part of it. And you got to just take pride in, in the whole thing and be glad that you're, you're on the journey at all. Back to that Midwest values, big dog. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let's fucking go. Um, I want to talk about competitiveness. You, know, you, talk, you, you briefed about it a, a little bit, but you have a weird, not weird, but you have a particular um, situation where you're dating a girl, Katie from Waxahachie, who's in the same business yeah. as you. Is there any competitiveness yeah. when it comes down to like who's getting more successful, who's on the bigger festival build? Do you guys have a little like kind of like uh, love fights about who's popping more? <laughs> we have a great system where we talk in this voice and this is a thing that's kind of um we've done in my band for years and my friend justin i keep mentioning and my friend cyrus he's in my band we do this voice where it'll be like cool you got like we <laughs> so you know like, and we do it to each other and it's so funny and you know the tables were really turned because when katie and i started dating i remember i was going out on this tour on my record city music and i was like selling out shows and going into like double nights and venues and stuff. Like I remember like I did like two nights sold out Barry Barroom and two nights, the Troubadour, yeah. and, you know, she would be like, cool. You sold 1200 tickets and I sold 900. Cool. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then St. Cloud came out, you know, she dropped that yeah. bomb and you know, I'll be like, we were going on a tour around the same time last year and I, and we we're playing a lot of the same venues, but she'd be selling them out and I wouldn't, and I'd be like, cool the tables have turned <laughs> <laughs> so we have this great way and it's like it always i love it i think it's great and i do see the, in the ways in which katie and i push one another in our competitions and you know like to be transparent we've had moments of of real like the other one gets upset you know and it's happened right. on both ends and we, we have an honest talk about it and we always come out the other end having you know better for having had that conversation and and it's it, like any insecurity, if you just talk about it, you won't beat yourself up about it. And you, mm -hmm. you realize it's just kind of silly. You know, if Katie and I sit down and have an honest talk of, honestly, it's just kind of hurts to see that this person said a great thing about you and they said a hurtful thing about me. And then, you know, Katie's like, I don't know this person and I can't control this, you know? And, yeah. and then you're like, oh yeah, of course, duh. It's, you know, and it's great to have these sort of honest talks, but also the voice helps a yeah. lot. <laughs> cool. We're constantly doing yeah, <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. Um, Pitchfork yeah, gave you a and, seven, they gave me a five. Cool. <laughs> it's fucking so <laughs> fucked up. That, there's it's, plenty of that. It's so funny. It's, it's so, funny. so fucked and then, up. I know. It'll be like, uh, yeah. It's, it's What was it's the biggest great. fight y'all had over something fucking silly? And then you realize, like, what are we fighting over? <laughs> Some journalist from fucking Rolling Stone? <laughs> Yeah, something like that. I don't know if there's any huge blowouts. It's it's more just a bunch of small like, <laughs> like it's all yeah. I don't know ticket sales like whatever. There yeah. hasn't been any like huge blowout or anything like that where it's like we stopped speaking or something because someone you know outsold the other one by a couple hundred tickets. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. There hasn't been any blowout because I think at the end of the day, I mean, Katie and I talk about it all the time. We're like indie rock is embarrassing. This is like <laughs> it's like high school. Like, it is. It's amazing. Like, it's a fucking embarrassing, you know, like we're also self-important. I, like, I know. It's so stupid. <laughs> and so I think we have a good understanding of that. We love songwriting and we love songwriters and we love music and we, we want to be a part of that legacy of, you know, the American songbook. And that's like a really great thing. We both know enough to know that it's again, all about just continuing on and doing the work and being able to like take the dips and take the rises and not take either of those things too seriously. Right. And uh, we know at the end of the day, these blogs, these whatever, it's like, it's all stupid and, and no one knows yeah. what they're fucking doing. I'm like, you know, sometimes with a writer, as we get older too, it's like, oh, this writer said something bad about me. And you're like, I know, you know, like, like now writers are, a lot of them are younger, you know? And, I remember when I was like 18 and just joined Woods and I was living in Brooklyn and there's all these like pitchfork writers or stereo gum writers or, uh, you know, there's this blog hipster runoff, like all these people are Brooklyn vegan and they were all like in their mid twenties. So they seemed older to me. Like they, yeah. you know, like, Oh, these are real adults, you know, who, who have these opinions. And now I'm in my mid thirties and I'm like, man, these are, it's like some hungover kid. <laughs> like, yeah. like, 
you, you know, just it, they're doing their job and they're just like, they're just trying to make a buck and that's, yeah. you know, they're, they're hustling like anyone else. And we're all just, it, it, it's an ecosystem, you know? Well, yeah. And it doesn't help that, you know, our society is based on shock value. So like, they're going to get more views when they talk shit about somebody like be a fucking troll, you know, than versus like giving, so kissing someone's ass about a record. Dude, I had this thing. So my record, Oh my God, got panned by pitchfork. And it was one of those things where it was like universally acclaimed by like everyone else by the universe. Yeah. And then pitchfork came in kind of hot with this, this like, well, we're going to be the ones to say that this is not, what we think, you know, we think, we think this is bad and <sighs> fucking the, it's, it's like that. so it's one of those things where I was like, you know, because up to that point, they'd really been praising me and I'd gotten best new music, like two records before that. And then the record before that got a good review. And I liked the writer, Laura Snapes, who wrote that review. And I thought it was very thoughtful. And then comes this review that's so unthoughtful and it seemed so out of place. Like they had been talking about that record a lot. And then suddenly this guy, uh, you know, is taking pride in tearing it down. And I remember being so upset by it the night it came out and I was at rehearsals. Like I was at rehearsals in Brooklyn and I put together this eight piece band and we were projected to lose money on this tour because of the expenses were so high. And that review came out. I remember being like, Oh my God, like I fucked up. Like I, no one's going to care now and no one's going to come to the shows. And um, I remember I, you know, it was like, I had to sell a thousand dollars in merch every night to break even, you know, Fuck. and I never really, and, and so I was like, like that would just give me to break even. And so I just remember I was like, I'm so defeated. I'm so exhausted. I'm like losing my voice at these rehearsals. Yeah. And now Pitchfork's my album sucks. Like, wow, everyone's going to return, want a refund, you know? Yeah. And then, the first show was at the Ace Theater in LA and it was like the best to this day, the best show I've ever played. It was an incredible night. And again, it was, it was, it was one of these nights where I think that holds like 1300 people or yeah. something, or maybe like 1500 and we sold 1300 tickets. Sick. And I remember there, there was a moment where I was like, Oh man, I didn't sell this out. But then I was like, I've never sold 1300 tickets. It's fucking incredible. That I sold this many tickets. And anyways, I played the show and it was so great. It was like, so it just, I couldn't believe how, how well it went. It's the mind, it was, bro. It's the mind. You got to not let, you can't, you can't let it, uh, you can't let it get you. I, it, it, I just remembered laying in bed that night with this feeling of like, I did it. And like, imagine how I bailed. Mm -hmm. Imagine how, and you know, the first, the first record I ever did was with the babies. And like, that was, you know, we had like, it's a 12 song record and 10 of them were my songs and pitchfork gave it like a 5.8. And this was in the era of mid mid two thousands where bands would just break up if Pitchfork gave them a bad review. I know so right. many bands from Brooklyn who are like, we're done. We quit. You know, <laughs> they get that five and they'd be like, we're out. We're, we, you know, I'm, I, I got job applications. I'm going to just go door to door and, you know, <laughs> try to sell Bibles now. Um, but uh, it's good to get hit in the face every once in a while. I Why? truly believe that because it shows your worth. Yeah, totally, man. You know, I think of, I think of it, you know, remember when um, Michael Jordan retired from, from basketball, went to baseball, and then came back, had a shitty year. Everyone thought he was done, and then he had the best, like, best year of his career the next year. It's like sometimes yeah. you need that motivation from those haters to, like, give you that best show or give you that best performance. And I'll say there's, there's moments, too, that then when you do get that praise, like when you've been on both sides of it and you've gotten the teardown and then you get the buildup, you don't take the buildup as seriously as you need to either because again right. you're like the veil has been lifted you're like these are just people out in the world it's really am amazing and flattering that this person got such a high opinion of this thing that i worked really hard on mm -hmm. and i'm great for it but you can't get too attached to that either you can't right. get too attached to the negativity or the positivity you got to just remember like i'm i'm a songwriter and you know this is all I, like i really you know in that era of oh my god i got really into reading shitty reviews of mm -hmm. of you know legacy art Leonard Cohen or whatever and people just been dragged through the mud and you know the music outlives a fucking article you know exactly that's why I'm saying I'm gonna pump you up right now Kevin fuck Pitchfork don't even worry about them this is all about you big dog don't let these journalists tell you that you're fucking good or not don't let that fucking ruin your moan because you are a fucking legend you got the Airbnb money now baby let's go let's go <laughs> did that change I your life most out of that was dude a beautiful stranger. I mean, that song is everywhere. 
everywhere. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a very delicate song to me, and that I had a hard time sinking to that because you know I um, that song's always been for charity. It would, it's been like a charitable single. We've we've always given the profits away, and with that Airbnb single, we said no. This is actually a big. This is a, a back to career defining sort of advice. I've just gotten to a place where I've I that Airbnb commercial is the first time I ever said no to something with music uh, that wasn't mm-hmm. because of a logistical reason where like I can't play this you know because I'm already playing another show or something. This was the first time where I didn't feel it was right to sync that song to Airbnb with the fee that they sent me. So I said, you know, this is a charitable song and this is a good fee and I appreciate it. But if you were to give me this fee, I would donate all of it or half of it, or maybe I'd pay myself out for the first time. I don't know. But any of those things, I just don't think I can do it. So I said, no. And then they came back a second time and they were like, you know, can we work something out? And then we're like, you know what? No, like, thanks, but no thanks. And then they came back a third time and they were like, we really want to like, can we just ask you why? And we, we ended up talking it out. We really talked it out with them and they were great. They were amazing. And we basically got to this place where we paid ourselves out for the song for the first time. But in order to do so, I was like, I'm going to need, I'm, I'm going to need more money to donate to charity than I'm going to get paid. And they were so cool about it. They gave us a whole lot of money um, to allocate to charities that we wanted to. And we got to drop these charitable bombs on everyone. It was fucking amazing. Hell and yeah. it, it was a great process, man. It was, it was really, and it was the first time that I ever said no. And I got met with such reward and it was it was it was just a beautiful experience all, all across the board. We you know we ended up hiring this uh, wonderful woman to help us allocate the money of, of the funds, and that was a whole learning experience. And I've been in contact with a, a number of these funds that are a number of these organizations that we donated to, and um, two of them were here in Kansas City, and like they didn't know about each other, but now they're linking up, and it was a really great experience. The whole thing. Little Mother Teresa over here, Kevin Morby. Hell yeah, dog. Good for you, bro. You know, isn't it powerful saying no? <laughs> it's so powerful. Uh, in in that case, like, it especially was, like saying no to that much money. That's crazy. I know, I know, and it is a crazy thing. And I, I'm I'm lucky in that I've been able to save some money, and I live in an affordable city where I don't have to you know worry about it too much. But that was definitely. It was it. It felt powerful to just for the first time ever be like, thanks but no thanks. I mm-hmm. appreciate it, but I just can't do it. And then to to get to a place where we could work on the terms to where it felt good, so it wasn't just on someone else's terms. Well, that's amazing, bro. I'm so happy for you, and you're doing great things, and keep writing great music. I know we got to get out of here, and I got one last question. By the way, this has been amazing. Thanks, bro. I really appreciate. It. I know that we didn't really great. talk about music too much, and then we talked about the business side and your personal, but I really appreciate you t- taking the yeah, time. I'm about. It's a I appreciate it. Um, hope you and Katie live this beautiful life together. Um, also, go two things. I got two things. You know, you talk about you saw the relate. You saw like how a a, a band kind of was getting fucked up with a husband and wife as a bandmate. Would you ever be in a band with Katie? <laughs> Knowing that, you know, people are always asking when we're going to make a record together, when we're going <laughs> to tour together again. And up until now, we've kept it all very organic. Like we will collaborate on you know in the studio or on stage, but it's all very like, oh, this will work out. Like, oh, I can be in the, that city that day. And I don't know, it would be cool to push it to the next level because I think people would really like it. We're doing those Instagram shows during the pandemic and people seem really grateful for those and kind of taking that out into the world could be cool. But if it feels like the natural thing to do, we'll do it. And if it feels unnatural, we won't. Well, Kev, I know you got to go. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, new record also has featuring our girl, Erin Ray. Fucking tight. I heard she's on the new record. Oh, yeah. she's Yeah, she's she kills it. She's the shit, dude. She's like one of my close friends. Um, so go grab it, Kev. And then I got one last question. I'll let you go. What do you want to be remembered by? I will want to be remembered by, you know, um, I want to be remembered just just being a... I want to be remembered by being a good, good, a good person. A good person who... Uh, <laughs> I, want, I, I don't know. I take pride in... Katie always calls me the mayor because she's like, you know everyone and you're always introducing people to other people. I take pride in that. I like I like that um, I, I kind of create the party a lot of times. I want to be remembered as the guy who, uh, who, who you know, 
got the people together in one room and had a good time. Like Bill Moore, like Bill Murray, baby. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kev, go do your thing. Go make some beautiful hits. Go have fun with your girlfriend. Go fucking enjoy Kansas City. Um, and uh, tell Kansas City I say hello because I, I really do miss that place. I will. All right, buddy. I'm literally going to the dentist right now. Where are you going? Not nearly as a dentist. Oh, well, clean those teeth, baby. We need, you know, that <laughs> use that Airbnb money, baby. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Later, later buddy. buddy. Take care. Kevin Morgan. Bye. Thanks, buddy.